Hi, my name is Natalie Benet. Today we're going to talk about ovarian histology. First, we'll start with an outline of ovarian anatomy, then cellular constituents, and a few non-neoplastic ovarian lesions. This is an anterior view of the uterus with attached fallopian tubes and ovaries. The ovary is a firm almond-shaped organ measuring about 3.5 centimeters long by 2 centimeters wide and 1 centimeter thick. It's attached to the back of the broad ligament by the mesovarium, through which blood vessels pass to enter the hilum. It is attached to the pelvic wall by the suspensory ligament and the uterus by the ovarian ligament. The ovary is divided into two layers, the cortex, noted at the arrow, which contains ovarian follicles and stroma, and the medulla, noted at the asterisk, which is central and contains loose connective tissue and blood vessels, lymphatic spaces, and nerves. This is a simplified cartoon version of the maturation of follicles and ovulation, which will nonetheless assist with identification on histologic sections. Folliculogenesis refers to the continuous process occurring throughout the reproductive life, whereby primordial follicles mature during each menstrual cycle. The prepubertal ovary contains primordial follicles, which are not indicated here, which consist of an oocyte surrounded by a single layer of granulosa cells. A large number of primordial follicles begin the process of maturation into primary follicles. When this happens, the granulosa cells which surround the oocyte plump up and become active. A subset of these primary follicles are recruited to the secondary follicular stage, during which the theca cells appear and begin to secrete androgens, which the granulosa cells convert into estrogens. Next, the follicle develops a fluid-filled cavity surrounding the oocyte, known as an antrum, noted at the blue asterisk. It is now referred to as an antral or graphian follicle. Only one of these follicles will mature to the point of ovulation, which is pictured in the cartoon. The corpus luteum pictured here is a yellow lobulated slash serpiginous structure with a cystic center and has luteinized granulosa and theca cells. And then if the corpus luteum or when the corpus luteum undergoes um, involution, it regresses and is then known as a corpus albicans. This is a graphical depiction of the typical 28 day menstrual cycle. Follicular maturation begins during the luteal phase, which is indicated here in the uh, orange part of the graph at the bottom. And you can see the follicle or the oocyte beginning maturation um, right before the number 28 on the screen. It is um, driven by the aptly named follicle stimulating hormone noted at the top graph FSH. Each month, only one egg completes the phase and is ovulated following the surge of luteinizing hormone, which you can see in green on the top graph. Those are the pituitary hormones. Progesterone levels are highest during the luteal phase, or the second half of the menstrual cycle, and is secreted by the corpus luteum, while estrogen peaks around the time of ovulation, which you can note on the uh, blue box labeled ovarian hormones graph. These are primordial, or I'm sorry, primary follicles, which appear at the third month of fetal development. This is also an excellent picture to point out ovarian type stroma, which is composed of cells which are spindled in shape and show a storiform or cartwheel pattern. I put a picture of Tigger doing a cartwheel so you'll remember what that means. These are secondary follicles, um, which begin to develop fluid filled antrums pictured on the um, right hand picture. There's a circle in the middle, and then the antrum is this fluid-filled space I'm pointing to. Theca internal cells develop and luteinize around the follicle. You can also see call exner bodies at this stage, which are indicated in the photo on the left. Those are those bright uh, pink eosinophilic small round structures um, within the follicle, follicular cells. When mature or graphene, the follicles show a large cystic space 
um, with the stalk connecting the egg um, back to the edge of the follicle being known as the cumulus oophorus at the blue asterisk in these photos. Following ovulation, ovarian follicles undergo reorganization and form a corpus luteum, pictured here grossly. Grossly, these look yellow due to their high lipid content. They are absorbed deeper into the ovary, form a clot, and blood vessels from the theca interna invade it, and beca it becomes vascularized and secretes hormones. This is a low-power histologic view of a corpus luteum with serpiginous or snake-like architecture in the ovary. This is a higher-powered view of a corpus luteum showing the cells with eosinophilic to amphiphilic cytoplasm and small to medium-sized nuclei with micronucleoli. This is a low-powered view of an ovary with a corpus luteum, which is partially cystic and communicates with the ovarian surface. There's also a cortical inclusion cyst noted here, which we'll talk about in a little bit on the top left of the screen. The brown cells noted at the edge of the ovary are hemocytin-laden macrophages, indicate, indicative of hemorrhage at this site. After 10 to 14 days, if no fertilization occurs, the corpus luteum shows degeneration and involution, and the cells become lipid-laden and undergo autolysis. Following this period of involution, a corpus albicans is formed, consisting of a white scar composed of hyaline material made from degenerated cells of the corpus luteum. This is a postmenopausal ovary which shows numerous corpora albicantia. This is a higher power view of a corpus albicans with the fiber cells interfacing with the ovarian stroma. These are examples of ovarian surface epithelium, which was thought to be the precursor to epithelial ovarian carcinoma, but this theory has been challenged. Nonetheless, ovarian surface epithelium is single, focally stratified um, to cuboidal layer of cells present at the surface of the ovary. It's often denuded in the process of handling the specimen, uh, cutting the specimen, and making the slide. Occasionally, the ovarian surface will show benign surface papillations termed surface adenofibromatous change. This is a benign finding, but it may show up in pelvic washings, and it's, good, it's a good thing to note. Cortical inclusion cysts are presumed to be invaginations of the surface epithelium. They can show cilia, as in the picture on the right. This is a wall third rest. These have been suggested to represent urothelial rests within the gynecologic tract. They're often located in paratubal or hilar tissue. They can become cystic and even show mucinous change. Another benign cell you'll note in the ovary is a hilar cell. These are morpho morphologically identical to Leydig cells of the testicle and are found, as the name suggests, near the ovarian hilum. Mild hyperplastic changes in these cells is more common in postmenopausal women. When these cells aggregate together to form small nodules, they're known as hilar cell nodule. Rinky crystals are present in some hilar cells, as pictured on the bottom right with the arrows. These are reedy ovarii, which are analogs of the reedy testis and present in the hilum of the ovary. They consist of a network of irregular clefts, tubules, and cysts with flat to, cu to cuboidal to columnar lining. These are Wolfian remnants, also known as mesonephric duct remnants. These are usually a small duct or clustered glands around a small duct. They have scant cytoplasm and no cilia and the lumina can contain secretions, which are usually bright pink. This is an adrenal remnant. These are uncommon in women, but usually reported in the round ligament. They almost always are an incidental finding, but they can be associated with adrenal manifestations or virilization. Another benign finding in the ovary is deciduosis, which can be present in the ovarian stroma. These are identical morphologically to decidua noted in the uterine corpus during pregnancy or progesterone administration. 
The decidual cells are these cells here with that amphiphilic cytoplasm and the eccentric nuclei. These are usually associated, as I said, with elevated progesterone levels and are most common in pregnancy but can happen in trophoblastic disease or exogenous hormone administration. Follicular cysts occur most commonly in the reproductive years. They're usually asymptomatic, but they can become large, and they usually resolve spontaneously. And you can see at the bottom right, they are lined by follicular cells, usually um, only a few cell layers thick. Endometriosis is the ectopic location of endometrial glands and stroma outside of the endometrium. On the left is an example of stroma and glands, which has formed a cystic mass. The stroma is indicated with an asterisk, and the glandular portions in all three of these pictures are located with arrows. In the middle graph, you can see um, hemocytorin-laden macrophages surrounding that cystic space full of old blood and then the stroma located at the asterisk and the glands located at the arrow. Similar findings on the right, just at a higher power, endometrial glands and stroma. This is the end of the ovarian histology lecture. Thank you for listening.